Welcome back to the panel's choice. Here we ask each panel member to pick a topic from this week that they feel is important to discuss. We'll start with Donna's pick. Conservatives have found an unexpected ally in the fight against mandatory vaccines, Black Lives Matter. The founder has called de Blasio's mandates modern day freedom papers. Donna, tell us about this exciting plot twist. Yeah. Well, you know, I very, very rarely agree with Black Lives Matter, but I'm totally with them on this one. This is an attack on civil liberties against African Americans. But de Blasio and both Biden know that African Americans have the lowest vaccination rates. It's only 40%. And they deliberately, deliberately added these mandates to destroy the black community. They've created a modern day Jim Crow so that unvaccinated can go into restaurants, they can't keep their jobs. And so Black Lives Matter is marching against that because they said that they thought he was on their side and they're finding out that they're not. And you know what should be uh, noted here is that the support for Joe Biden from the African American community has plummeted 17%, which is unheard of. Well, and what's interesting about this, and I talked uh, with Christina Crum about this earlier in the show, but um, the White House is saying that they have eliminated vaccine inequ inequities, meaning everybody's about the same when it comes to being vaccinated. Yeah, and they also said that they got all Americans out of, out of Afghanistan, but we both know that's not true. It's probably 10 times that amount. They are creating more inequities since they've been in office. You know, with all of their mandates, um, yeah. with all of these new policies, uh, racial social environmental injustice you know all of these policies are directed at making sure the black community is lower than they have ever have been so black lives matter has been quite instrumental in getting biden into office and trying to provide a lot of political cover do you think we'll start to see them crack in some other areas as well as they see more and more how Democrats are pushing back against the black community? Absolutely. They've already said that they've been used. They said that on day two. You know, when there were people saying they were remorse, remorseful about voting for him, they were the number ones that came out and said that they were. So I think they're going to push back on a lot. What's so disturbing, though, and uh, terrible to me is that the mainstream media is not covering this. Right. Very interesting topic. Thank you. Next, we have Terry's pick. Democrat nominee and former Governor Terry McAuliffe is defending his veto of a bill in 2016, which would have mandated that schools inform parents of sexually explicit materials and lessons and allow them to opt their children out of those lessons. Terry, tell us about your topic. Well, Christina, this came uh, in, during the debate this past week between Terry McAuliffe and, and Glenn Youngkin. And Glenn Youngkin went on offense and he attacked Terry McAuliffe because the Fairfax County School Board was exposed for providing ex sexually explicit. We're talking not like, you know, soft core stuff or even like, you know, we're talking graphic sex, same sex relationships between adults and minors that are in our public schools and our public libraries and all of that. And Terry McAuliffe's response was, Parents are the enemy. They have no business telling these schools what they can and can't do our children. Look, it, he said the quiet part out loud. Yeah. He said the quiet part out loud that Democrats have been feeling. And actually, just today, a group of Democrat school boards from across the country are petitioning the Biden administration to look into the parents that are speaking out at these school board meetings that are upset about everything as domestic terrorists. That is terrifying. And how I don't understand how someone gets to the point where they think they have more authority than parents over children. Well, it's it's really about whether or not you think families are good or bad. And the Democratic Party has fully embraced the notion that parents and families are evil. We saw this with Black Lives Matter and, and what they push out. They want to abolish the family. And that's because Marxism cannot exist with families. It can't exist with Christianity. It can't exist with normal people who want to live good lives and be happy. And that's what they're tapping into. So I, I would just urge parents, you have to get more engaged in politics from every level, from the school board all the way to the presidencies. This these guys hate you and they yeah. want to destroy you they want to brainwash your children they think your children belong to them not you that's an interesting point you make about families and how we see democrats saying we want to destroy families and we want to control everything what is it specifically about families that threatens or uh, eliminates the ability for Marxism to exist? Well, the family is a competitor for authority, right? So when you have a strong family, your priority is your family. You want to 
when I go to work every day, I don't go to work to make more money. I go to work to make more money for my family, not to pay more taxes, not to make Jeff Bezos richer and make sure he can not only go to the moon, but go to Mars. I go to work for my family. And these corporations and government, they want us to be paying their bills. They want us to be responsive to them and having them be the priority. It's totally backwards. It's unnatural and it won't work. Very interesting topic. Thank you so much. All right, next we've got Jim's pick. In 2016, ABC News reported exactly how election theft could work. Today, ABC News, along with every other large corporate outlet, is silent on the issue. Jim, what are your thoughts on the media's role in election integrity? Well, it's really interesting because I was just going through some old notes and I ran across this article, you know, about, yes, it's possible to hack the election yeah. from 2016. You can't publish this today in the mainstream media. They, they wouldn't accept it, certainly not at ABC News. I, by uh, Richard Clark, a noted cybersecurity expert, served on three presidential panels on how to do it. And then when you read through the article, it details exactly the kinds of things that you have been reporting about from Arizona, the kind of things that we were talking about, voting machines hooked to the internet, missing audit trails, all these kind of things. This article is almost like a roadmap of how to do it and the things that we have seen. And uh, not to mention all of the COVID things that came in, you know, the kind of extending the voting yeah. hours and having all these paper ballots, absentee ballots kind of floating around, like California now is gonna do for every election. Right. And uh, it's just interesting of how our debate has sunk because back in 2016, when it was, you know, Hillary Clinton was going to be hacked by the Russians or something like that, then you could at least talk about it. Uh, now you can't even talk about it. Why do you think that is? Uh, certainly there could be some corporate motivation, you know, there, there could be some larger issue. But reporters, and a, lo and a lot of these networks, reporters can report. They do have some liberty to report on other topics. Why do you think nobody is reporting on this? Uh, well, it doesn't fit the narrative. Uh, they don't want to side with... But it's with, to their detriment, like to their own well, personal detriment. Uh, it, well, I don't know if, if they have switched from being journalists to being ideologues to being, you know, advocates for this, you know, specific narrative, then that's the way that they're going to go. They know that their editors would squash anything that went against that narrative. And so they stick to it. They don't want to give Donald Trump even a little, you know, thin ray of daylight saying, well, maybe there were some irregularities in the election. I mean, which clearly they were. Whether you think it through the election or not, that's another issue. But I mean, the fact is that there were all kinds of numbers that don't match up. And they right. just absolutely refuse to report on And just the manner in the way the election was conducted, it seems like they want to erase your memory of this was a very weird election. Whether you think there was any fraud at all or not, it was weird in the way that it was conducted with the mail-in ballots, with early voting, with social distancing. With all, the whole procedure about it was, was off and different. Absolutely. And these vote counts that went on for days and days where you'd get like a little tranche of another 10,000 votes, maybe a little dribble of a few more votes until, you know, put Biden over the right. top. I mean, things like that are just strange. Why weren't those votes counted like immediately, like every other single election? Right. There were, and Arizona was one of those states where there would, they would for days only count 10,000 votes. Like I could count 10,000 votes by myself, let alone the entire state of Arizona election workers working on it, why, why did they only get 10,000 votes? The only, to me, the only reason is because they were waiting to have more ballots added to put Biden over the top. I think that's a reasonable thing, but yeah. the point is you can't even discuss it. Whether it was that or whether it was something else, let's have the discussion. Let's exactly. talk about the audit fully. And, you know, back in 2016, you could do it. I, great topic. Thank you. Last but not least, we have Malik's pick. D.C. gun advocates say that the prohibition on ghost guns violates the Second Amendment. Malik, do you agree or disagree, and how does this impact a liberal city like Washington, D.C.? So, let me try to unpack this. Um, so, um, gun advocates filed this case with Heller. Heller is, um, you know, most people who are in, you know, Second Amendment advocates, they know of Dick Heller because he successfully, he was part of the group that successfully um, sued the district in 2008. So the whole ghost gun case came about because um, Heller went to North Carolina and I think he bought a um, nine millimeter gun kit from a seller in North Carolina. Because of DC's laws, he's not able to actually have the gun here. So what they're challenging in court is the notion that DC actually has a ban on things like ghost gun because it infringes upon your right to um, 
you know, um, bear arms. This is actually part of a longer history with Heller and Gunn advocates here in D.C. Because in 2015, they successfully um, sued in court, and because the D.C. did not want to actually take this and lose again all the way up at the Supreme Court level, that's how we ended up getting concealed carry. And they actually relaxed bans on things like stun guns. If you go back to 2008, the original Heller decision, what a lot of people don't know is that prior to Heller, D.C. was governed under the Firearms Control Regulations Act, I think, of 1975, which meant that D.C. residents could not have guns. Well, in order to own a gun in D.C., the gun had to be unloaded, unassembled, or with a trigger lock in your own home. This is because of the 1975 decision. And even because of that 1975 um, regulation, D the only guns that could be registered in D.C. were guns that were registered prior to 1975. My liberal friend who's actually watching this, he was, he's the one who explained this to me because he's a big second A advocate. Now, part of the reason that I actually, well, the biggest reason that I chose this topic because it shows conservatives that mm -hmm. we don't have to always go around trying to get people to become conservatives or register as Republicans. There are issues that we can actually agree on, and Second Amendment is a very big thing. I'm actually working with the Heller Foundation now on trying to provide um, gun safety training, right. um, you know, try to get people registered for guns, even the concealed carry licenses, domestic violence um, awareness month right. is approaching. So I'm actually going to be working with the Heller Foundation to try to get personal protection training here for residents in D.C. because these are things that conservatives can do and we have the resources to do it and this is how we can make inroads right. not by just knocking on doors we can actually make inroads substantively around policy and second amendment is a very big thing. I think that's right and I think Donna's topic also is yeah. one as well. Don't go anywhere when we come back from the break we've got don't be fooled and my closing argument we'll be right back.